Hi, and welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. We're here today with Genji Cohan, David E. Kelly, Lisa Joy, Noah Hawley, Ava DuVernay, and Ryan Murphy. And we're just gonna dive right into this. So most, if not all of you, have multiple projects going right now, uh, some TV shows, some films. Curious how much pressure there is at this point in the industry to sort of build a quote unquote empire. There's a lot. <laughs> I think we should defer to Ryan. Yeah, he's the, he's the king. So you have a few projects. I never hear that from anybody. I never feel that pressure or hear that word. I just sort of feel like I feel a lot of people in the business probably do, that once you get an opportunity to get a yes, mm -hmm. you lean into the yes because you're used to years and years of no. So if you are so lucky to have something that works, that's a dream come to life, if you get another dream, I think your impulse is to move towards the dream and try and get that ignited. That's what I love to do. And what I've learned to do is to have like a group of three or four really strong collaborators mm -hmm. who, you know, lieutenants who can help me, who also have the same dream or the same interest. So I've put together a team that I love and mm -hmm. we support each other. But I don't know, I feel like the, I feel like the television business has exploded so sure. much that there is great opportunity for content if you have the track record and the will. That's how I feel. Sure. No, you had said recently that once Fargo became a real success and you had some real heat behind you, you started saying yes a lot and then all of a sudden... Well, yeah, like Ryan said, I think there's a freelance muscle where there's feast or famine and certainly as a showrunner and broadcast, you put everything you have into a show, they cancel it after two episodes and then you have nothing. You have to rebuild from scratch. So there was a certain moment where I thought, well, the more things you have going, the less you're riding that roller coaster. But is there uh, a point where you say, "Oh God, well, I have yeah, too many I mean, things"? I, I think for me, I, what I didn't realize was, you know, at the point at which uh, the show that you make is successful, then whatever you say yes to is going to get made. I, I was still in the old <laughs> paradigm, so uh -huh. so that's how I found myself with so many things. Uh -huh. I just so I've learned to say no. I'm not sure I have yet, but I've learned. I'm, I'm holding out. There'll be a no soon. <laughs> yeah. The rest of you, and how hard is it to say no? I mean, is that something that's in your vernacular? Can you do that? Do you have the confidence to say no? I, I think one, of, if you look around this table, they're all good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, with success sometimes comes the burden to be successful. So uh, when someone comes to you with a project, more than likely it's going to be someone you have worked with, a studio partner before, and, and they've already cultivated a loyalty. And, the best projects, the best companies feel like teams. Mm -hmm. And I think there's part of us that want to be a team player. So you do want to lean in. But I think that the key is to uh, step back and try to approach the material with an objectivity to see if it's really what you love and want to write. Because if you don't love it, it's the job turns into a monumental grind. And if you do love it, you wake up and you never have to go to work. Yeah. I think when you ask the question about the confidence to say no, I think embedded in that very question is uh, the idea that privilege does not apply. Mm -hmm. And so for me to say no, uh, in my mind, in the way that I internalize it and process it, is very much uh, that there may not be another chance. And there's a natural tension with anyone, no matter who they are, woman, person of color, anyone. Mm -hmm just in this industry to get mm -hmm. the chance for the open door. But when you add to that, that uh, there are issues of representation and marginalization that go on top of the artist's natural feeling of, can I get my thing made? Um, that there's another barrier if you're a woman and another barrier if you're a person of color on top of the barrier of just an artist trying to work in this industry, it becomes really challenging for me to say no. I get an opportunity from Netflix. Do you want to make a doc? Yes. I want to make a doc. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make a, a commercial? Apple? Yes, I will make that commercial. I mean, I'm running around doing everything <laughs> because I enjoy it. I love it. But also when I really interrogate it, there is a, the fear that any artist has that there won't be another question asked to say no to. And then on top of that, the fear that the industry might shift mm -hmm. in terms of its attention to women right now or in terms of the current renaissance regarding people of color, specifically black folk on TV. And then you're left with, with, with nothing. But yeah. it's also deceiving, I will say, because when I was first starting up, coming up in the business, you know, you would do 22 episodes of a show a year. And that has completely, for the most part, 
fallen away. So I think that sometimes people look at the amount of projects you're working at, and they really should be looking at the number of episodes. For example, mm -hmm. when we did Glee, it was 22, 24, Feud is eight. So if you have three of those, it equals to one old network mm -hmm. order. And for me, it just became something I loved because when I was growing up, I always loved the idea of, um, you know, a studio system mm -hmm. where you were under contract and you were constantly working on stuff and you got to try a lot of different genres and work with a lot of different artists. And I always hungered for that. So when the opportunity came, that's, I think, why I am so crazily prolific, just because sure. it's exciting yeah. and, and you well, know, everyone, energy begets energy. Everyone loves the new baby mm -hmm. and giving birth to a new show in that first year where you're discovering and it's, it's, a, it's a high, you mm -hmm. get a hit off that and it's hard to turn that down, especially if you've been grinding something out for a really long time and it's, it's a little more awkward and, uh -huh. a, little, you know, and a little more adolescent. To the thought of, oh, I, you can start fresh and create something new is exciting. And is the flip side of that, do you, do you feel, do you ever fear you're going to be stretched too thin, that you don't have the time to devote to something? Sure. And it's your name on it. Yeah. And yeah. your name means something more each, with each passing day and with each success. For me, it touches a little on what Ava was talking about, too. And, and you guys have all done amazing things that have your voice. And they're really distinctive and singular and, and wonderful, you know? And there is that pressure not only to be prolific, but to not fuck up, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. especially when you kind of feel the added burden of, I'm a woman who's doing this now. You know, I represent this. And also, I represent opportunities for other women mm -hmm. and other people of color, you know? And, and I'm trying to start my own kind of movement and the pressure to just, you know, really watch over your baby and shepherd it throughout. And I know this is for everybody who cares about their product, but it's, so you're kind of counterbalancing that with your ability to take on more and more projects. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in between, there's a, there's a good balance. Sure, <laughs> sure. All right, so between the six people at this table, you have explored, and I'm gonna get this right, you've explored themes including harassment, rape, murder, sexism, classism, racism, misogyny, mental illness, I could keep going, but I'm not going to. <laughs> As storytellers, when was the last time you were sort of genuinely nervous to tackle a, a big subject? In the executive suite, generationally, it has changed. Mm -hmm. And so now I feel like all of the things that you just listed, if you do a piece of material that doesn't dig into that, the executives tell you that you're failing, that you're not doing enough. Whereas when I started, you couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Like as a gay person trying to write a gay character in 1998, it was so um, difficult. And I feel like that has a, been a generational shift in um, people who are coming up who are more social, more liberal, more interested in leaning into that, yeah. at least in, in my regard. I don't know what you guys feel, but I've felt that um, there's just an enlightenment, I think, going on in every mm -hmm. arena of television now that sure. wasn't there before. Which doesn't reflect society. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we had to take terrorism insurance out on, on our building. Wow. <laughs> okay. Really? Yeah. Um, Please expand. Uh, there's a project, well, there's always crazies out there. I mean, yes. I remember Shonda telling a story of people camping out outside her house when she killed McDreamy. Like, <laughs> people get crazy that. because they live with, they bathe in these characters mm -hmm. and they take it personally. And, you know, you're always going to do something that someone doesn't like. Yep. And you don't know how crazy that someone's going to be. So what did you do to upset us? Well, we, we, we're, we're developing a Teen Jesus project that got some people nervous. Uh-huh. Um, but it's it's like the Wonder Years, but with Jesus, and, um, and and just there's all sorts of things where we cross lines and people you know get weird about it. No, this past season in Orange, you took on police brutality, the Black Lives Matter. That didn't come with with any sort of nerves, any feeling of oh I have to get this right. Yeah, there's definitely the the pressure to get mm -hmm. things right. You want to get things right. Sometimes you get things right for a certain audience and wrong for another audience. And you can't please everyone. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I think it's just like a gut check. Am I enjoying this or am I feeling this or am I entertained by this? Because if you start thinking about whether it's appropriate for everyone, you're, you're, you're left with, you know, oatmeal. Come on, pick up, pick up! Just going down, come on, let's go. Hey, this mean we are gonna be on TV, but we're not gonna be on TV. I gotta know these things. It means sharpen your fucking eye pencil. 
I use liquid liner. Anyone been nervous to, to tackle something? The only thing that makes me nervous is that it's going to be too obvious what it's about in, mm -hmm. in that way, that, that, you know, it's not the job of the show to lecture or preach or right. tackle a subject. There's a lot of ideas and research that go into the work, but my hope is that it's invisible mm -hmm. on some level, that it's part of the story, it informs the story and the characters, but and if you want to think about it more deeply, then it's there for you. But, uh, you know, I, I live in fear of the this week on a special episode mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, announcement. You know, it's right. not my job to be topical. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my job is to tell you a good story. The stamp wasn't there, but I got this. Christmas. How much did he have, his account? I don't know, uh, maybe a million. Your brother has a million dollars and you took, what is that, 10 grand? No, see, that's the criminal mentality, your old life. And what are you, hardwired patterns. But uh, we're not crooks. This, this is the principle. What's right? Fair market value for the, what, what, what he took, the, the, the stamp. For me, I feel like it has to be about something. It can't just be, you know, characters on the run. But my hope is that, is that what it's about is part of the DNA of it. You, in, in Big Little Lies, I mean, tackled the domestic abuse piece, and you would watch scenes that were incredibly difficult to certainly watch as a viewer. I mm. presumably were hard to write and then hard to film. A, did it come with, with nerves and, and a feeling of pressure, and, and why sort of go there? It doesn't come with uh, nerves or nervousness with respect to how it's going to be perceived. Um, it was a difficult subject matter. When are you going to leave him, Celeste? <sighs> when he hurts you badly enough? When he hurts the children? He will never hurt the you children. You need to rent an apartment locally if you don't want to disrupt the boys' school. <gasps> whoa, 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 whoa. We're getting way ahead of ourselves here. No, I don't think so. The writing of it, it was upsetting and disturbing. Um, Nicole would talk a lot about how she would live that part in that mm -hmm. role, and it took a toll on her a little bit. And it does for the writer mm -hmm. as well. I mean, when you're in that world, that's... If other things are, are creeping through, then you're not in it enough. Mm -hmm. And if you're in it to the extent you should be, there's no way that you can mine a scene like that without being upset by it. But... Um, once you have surfaced from the world and the scene itself, I think you do put your producer hat on and, and ask your confidants around you um, for opinions because you want to make sure that mm -hmm. you've treated it responsibly. It was very tricky material, um, and we we obviously consulted a number of experts, and Nicole did as well, and Jean-Marc, the director, mm -hmm. did as well. But it was very treacherous terrain. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you don't you don't... Uh, live in that and then go whistling home to pick up your Starbucks. A lot of you guys have tackled really sort of challenging, uh, at times quite dark material. How would you sort of describe the conversations that you have with talent to get them in a place where they're comfortable with the material? Well, our cast, you know, signed up for a, a show that, you know, the challenge and the mission of the show was to create a world in which people of color, black people, had concerns other than being black, which is the way that I move about my day. Mm -hmm. Like, I have lots of things that have to do with race, but they're also something that has to do with culture, mm -hmm. class, with gender identity, how black folks uh, deal with, handle, and reconcile their association with other people of color. And within the show, it's about a black family that owns a farm, and they found that the way they feel about previous white landowners is the way that brown people feel about them. And that's a part of issues of gentrification that's, that are happening in this country overall. And so everyone signed up for this kind of experiment to see, could we make something that was appealing to all audiences and very much speaking to an audience of black television lovers that allows us to kind of get underneath the family drama into these issues that so often aren't tackled in black shows because mm -hmm. you're always talking about being black. So the cast was up and at them to do mm -hmm. and, and to kind of explore all of this. And to Noah's point, just trying to not make a very special episode of Queen Sugar about immigration. You right. know, it's like, you know, formerly incarcerated man is one of the lead characters. And instead of doing that in 
two episodes. The whole show is about how we treat formerly incarcerated people as second-class citizens in this country. How do they live? Mm-hmm. You see that every week through him, and it's a, just a part of his character. So I think when, you know, all these shows are so, and all his 10 shows, mm-hmm. are so kind of, I don't know, I feel like all of the artists that I see working on these shows are leaning in to what it is. They know what they're signing up for. That's the case here. They mm-hmm. know what they, they're signing up for, and they bring themselves to it in a way that just enlarges the whole piece. One thing I always do is just tell actors that I'm as afraid as they are, you know, because I I can sense it and I feel it too. And I feel if you have a community and you're creating something together, if everybody knows that there's not one answer and there's Mm -hmm. not one right way to do something, it, it creates communication. I did that with Susan when we were shooting Feud and she was um, signed on, but I constantly felt she was gonna bail. And I (laughs) finally got her to admit that she was afraid of, you know, Mm -hmm. tackling it. I said, well, I'm afraid too. And from that came a communication of, okay, how can we make this better for you and a safer space? And that's just what I try and do. And I am now at a point where I'm kind of only interested in doing stuff that scares me because that's where the goodness comes from. I was at the height of my career when she was little. We never enjoyed the quality time together like I had with you and Cindy. The little time that I did have, I worked so hard at instilling the proper values in her. I only wanted her to appreciate her advantages. Of course, honey, of course. How do you call up or or meet with an actor and say, I'm going to kill you off, which you had to do this past season? What is that conversation? It's very difficult. Yeah. It was because she was so beloved. Well, she was the moral compass. She was the sense of optimism on your show. And you wanted to have impact. I hated losing Samira, Uh but her death would have the greatest impact. And she was fantastic about it. She was, I get it, I understand. And... A lot of the other actors got very nervous and were, or, or were outraged and like, how could you do this to her? And it's like, I'm not doing it to her. This is the journey that this character has taken. This is where the show is going. But it's hard because they're enmeshed with their mm-hmm. characters as well. And you try to separate the actor from the part or the writer from the material, but it gets mushy sometimes. Sure, without question. Um, how much do actors know about what's coming? I mean, I think let's... <laughs> Jeffrey Wright was recently saying that they all sort of compare notes about <laughs> what everyone knows on Westworld. But is it helpful to have have these actors sort of know where, where they're going, or is it helpful to have them in the dark? What's your sort of take on that, Lisa? You know, I think it depends, and I think it depends on the part that they're playing. And so for, for Westworld, we had a kind of embedded timeline, right, where uh, William was the man in black. Um, and so you're seeing him as a young man, and you're also seeing him as an older man. And... For us, we just thought, well, what's the point in telling Jimmy Simpson, who's William, that he's going to be this guy? Like, just let him play this part. But on the other hand, for somebody like uh, Jeffrey Wright's character, he's playing two people, basically. Arnold and then the robot version of Arnold, Bernard. And each one, he's such a gifted actor. In order to kind of modulate his performance, we would tell him, okay, now this is you in this timeline and this is different. So case by case basis. And will season two, is it something, again, that you will keep certain characters in the dark? I will also tell you on a need-to-know basis. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see. I planned all of this. No, you didn't. You can even see the steps you're supposed to follow. You recruit another host to help you. Then you to make your way to the train. Then, when you reach the main... Watch it. No one's controlling me. I'm leaving. I'm in control. One of the other pieces that that a lot of shows have been exploring is sort of how this political climate has impacted uh, the world. How is the sort of Trump era uh, being infused, if in fact it is, into the shows that you are doing? You've talked about 
maybe exploring it with a season of American Horror Story, which may be fitting? Yes, we... Um, what does that look like? <laughs> a true American uh, Horror it Story. It is a true American Horror Story. Um, yeah, I mean, we're sort of leaning into it. I think that that sort of is interesting to us as writers, and so it begins election night. The show begins with election night and the national conversation and both the euphoria and the fear. And there will be a Trump and there will be a Hillary? On television. On television. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about the rest of you? Do you feel compelled to tell different stories in this era? It was frustrating because during the election we were already in and, and mm -hmm. we were stuck. And we were also limited because our timeline is slower than the timeline of life and we want to address these things. But do we just throw the timeline out the window because she's only been there a certain number of months mm -hmm. um, so we can embrace current culture? We're still debating it. I'm not sure how it's going to go. Season mm. five is season five, but for six, I don't think anyone can help but incorporate some of the feelings associated with what's going on and the divisions and all that stuff. What does that look like for the rest of you? We're uh, actively shooting. We're in the fifth episode, shooting the fifth episode right now of season two of Queen Sugar. And it's about a black family in the present moment. So there's no way you can't, you know, address the current climate and what we turn on the TV and are faced with and assaulted with every day. So it's certainly um, incorporated in the narrative in a way that is not a very special episode of Queen Sugar. <laughs> um, but, um, but definitely it's, it's, it's um, you know, the residue of all of it, how it kind of sticks to the skin, um, how these days I just, you know, wake up and look at my Twitter feed and, Either I'm fighting mad or completely depressed at whatever <laughs> happens to happen in the wee hours of the morning when tweets start to mm. show uh -huh. up. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're looking to address all of that this season. Sure. It was always m my goal months ago when I started writing this third year to deconstruct that phrase, this is a true story, mm -hmm. which started the movie and starts every episode and is an untrue statement because it's <laughs> not a true story at all. So... We start every hour by lying to people. Um, but also that idea of true and story was really interesting, those two words side by side, because a good story can seem true. That's mm -hmm. what we do, right? We make up a story and try to make it feel true. So I think a lot about what makes a story truthier mm -hmm. than, um, than a, a movie, you know? So a lot of times in the writer's room, I might say, that's a great twist, but it's a movie twist. What's the more random, the more accidental, the more coincidental version of what happened where it's not, you know, the white hat and the black hat at the end of the film? But then obviously, as we got into this election season and, and into the administration and this idea of post-truth and mm -hmm. alternative facts, uh, uh, I found myself writing in a very bizarre sort of parallel to, to what's actually going on. So you'll see in the course of the season, the the, these ideas are organic to the way the story is hmm. structured and this idea of truth and what makes something true and what makes something, um, how do you take a real scenario and make it feel fake and mm -hmm. then take a fake story and make it seem true is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're gonna take a little bit of a, a left turn, but I want to talk a little bit about feeling sort of pigeonholed in, in this industry. And I want, Lisa, a story earlier in your career, how you had a junior writer that you were working with, I believe, say something along the lines of, you really shouldn't talk, you know, no one really wants to hear from you, you're the, you're the diversity hire, that's why you're here, sort of stay quiet. <laughs> How does that experience sort of inform your experience going forward? I honestly think in some ways she was trying to be helpful. Uh -huh. You know, <laughs> like I think it was, don't feel any pressure, nobody expects anything from you. It was my first job. I came from a completely different industry and I think meant as a pep talk. Um, <laughs> uh, and, How'd that go? And it just, you know, it, it was one of those unnerving things where, and, and it's kind of why I, I consciously chose to talk about, you know, being a diversity hire for the first job because people tend to discount, like, oh, that means, oh, you're not really, you were chosen for some, to fill some quota. And it's just not the case, you know, mm -hmm. minorities are underrepresented. People from not even necessarily racial or in terms of gender, it's really hard to get a job as a writer and especially hard if you don't have like a kind of socioeconomic safety net mm -hmm. to become a writer's assistant and work for like six years in the hopes that you can get that one script, you know? And so programs like that really help, you know, bring new voices to the table, not just people of color, not just women, but also, you know, people of different backgrounds. And I think that's really important. And so, you know, when she told me that, I was, of course, 
horrified that I had been talking too much as I am right now. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think you just have to double down in the end. And you say, well, you know what? Everybody's going to think that or half the population is going to think that. But regardless of what they think, I have this toehold into this mm-hmm. opportunity and I need to kind of blast the doors off of it or else it's going to slam right back on me. <laughs> and then one of the things you did from there was go and work on very male shows. I mean, you right. worked on a burn notice, which is a, it's very much a sort of a male voice and presumably the room was also heavy on males. I mean, that was presumably a conscious decision on your part. Right, yeah. I wanted to uh, be able to say, you know, nobody ever has a problem if a man writes a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to say, well, I can write your men too and I can write your action. You know, and it, you don't just have to give me the love scenes, which mm-hmm. technically I don't even think are my strong <laughs> suit. So um, it was just about that. It was about trying to trying to take as many topics and saying they're not off limit for me or people like me. What are the things that you guys get approached for that you, the box that the industry sort of historically has wanted you to be in? Presumably people go back to you like, oh, you do the, law, the legal shows. Yeah, they want me to do a law show and I want Lisa to do a law show. <laughs> I'll do one with you. <laughs> it's a deal. Um, yeah, people want you to do what, what you you've do. done, and, and I think instinctively a lot of writers want to do what they haven't done. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly, I think we we want to get up and, and write something that excites us. And if the law actually still does interest me. I'm, you went I'm, back to it. I, mean, ultimately, I do. I'm fascinated by it. I think it's a great vehicle for exploring the ethical and um, moral centers of people. The process is so flawed, but it's the best one we've got for legislating sort of moral behavior. So I I do continue to love it, and actually, I miss it. In fact, in Big Little Lies, made Celeste a lawyer just because it was like a binky for me to have <laughs> one lawyer in the mix. But um, but yeah, I think that when w- people when when they're pitching things to me. The word lawyer usually is in the in the realm. So what what is it for the rest of you? What is the what is the thing? Or conversely, what is the thing that you wish people would come to you for because you know you're capable of, but that's not how the industry sort of sees you. Uh, I get the first black everything. Mm-hmm. First black firefighter in <laughs> Tacoma, Washington. First Tacoma, Washington. First black ballerina uh-huh. to dance in Kansas City. Uh-huh. I mean, it's getting so specific that I was like. Every first black doesn't need a movie, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and a lot of history, you know? Uh-huh. It's just whatever you did last, a lot uh-huh. of history. Uh-huh. Every, a lot of women uh-huh. these days, uh, women of all colors, women's history or black history. I get offered all these, like, wedding movies. And <laughs> I'm always, what in my body of work <laughs> would make you think that I'd want to write about a bride? <laughs> it's yeah. so weird. It's not as much on TV, but anytime... Movie stuff, and I also think the movies are behind us, frankly, at this point. But I just kept getting, you know, best friends and weddings, huh. and this, not not my wheelhouse, <laughs> not not where I want to live. I would like to see a movie. Yeah, I actually I would like to see. Yeah. Yeah. I would go to that movie. I would go to that. <laughs> maybe they're onto something. All right, maybe yeah, maybe it's my my personal challenge to subvert <laughs> the paradigm of wedding yeah. films. What do they go to you with? What are the things that you're? Well, anything with a feather boa, I get off of uh-huh. first. <laughs> I, I think Abe is right. It's, it always is about what you just did, right? So when I did The People versus O.J. Simpson, it was a lot of crime stuff, a lot of true crime stuff. And then it was, then I did Feud, and now it's a lot of Hollywood biopics. It's, mm-hmm. it's always trying to recreate sort of what your last visible creation was, I suppose. Is there a type of project that you are not approached for, but you would really like to uh, do, and here's your chance to, to say it? And I want to do an astronaut movie or an yeah. astronaut something. Hmm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know why, but I've always wanted to okay. do that. Okay. I've trained myself to say no now, so. <laughs> but the confidence <laughs> yeah. to say no. I think I move too fast for people to pigeonhole me yeah. on my way in mm-hmm. to the business, and I think just when they thought they'd figured it all out with Fargo, I made Legion, and, and you know, of course, that's a much more commercial venture, so then you start to have those conversations, you know, because those are the movies that people oh, yeah. really want to mm-hmm. make. But Does you that know, appeal to you? I mean, doing a big Marvel, a big DC movie? Well, not to do a for- formula, like, that's not interesting to me. I don't know how experimental that they're feeling. Um, not very But, usually. you know, there's room, I think, in... in you know, any of those multi-billion dollar franchises to make one that's just a different. 
Um, and they, and I think they are. Um, but then, you know, I also am a novelist, so I had a book come out last year. So, you know, I just, I knew from the first time I came to this town that I should just keep doing all the things that I love doing and eventually they'll either all work or they won't. Jenny, you have been vocal about sort of missing the water cooler conversation, uh, mm -hmm. given the rollout model of Orange on Netflix. I'm curious how you approach story, knowing that people will watch it on their own timelines. Do you worry about things getting out, and how do you approach uh, storytelling differently? I mean, with there's that? nothing to do about it. You know, we're still crafting things to drive through and leave people hanging. And it is a bummer when someone's watched everything in 48 hours mm -hmm. and has posted the spoiler and other people don't watch it till years later, wh whatever it is. Um, I mean, I think there's the benefit of instant gratification for people, but I also do miss having the audience on the same page at the same time. Mm -hmm. In terms of being able to do something about it, there's nothing I can do about that. You don't write differently. I mean, you, you just did Goliath on Amazon. Did you write Yeah, and that was weird. I, I totally agree. People watched uh, Goliath in a weekend, and uh -huh. I thought, you, you, there's got to be a law against it. <laughs> um, and you don't, you don't um, necessarily want that either. Why not? You, you, oh, I suppose that we have a fundamental arrogance that we think our product will, will resonate and be talked about afterwards, and that's, to me, there's the characters in the show you're writing, and then there's that other character, the viewer, mm -hmm. that you're including in that process. And to me, the best feedback that I used to get on episodes when people would be arguing in their living room about who was right and who was wrong, depending on what a character said or how a case came out, but that dialogue that ensued following an episode was gratifying, and we derive currency from that. Um, Big Little Eyes did get that because on once right. a week on mm -hmm. Sundays, so people would talk about it on right. Mondays. People talk about Feud on Mondays and OJ, Westworld, and far, you guys are all been able to unroll your product that way. Goliath, it, whoosh, yeah. it's a launch and, and it's said and done. And then it's out of the, con the public consciousness for a while. You go dormant and then mm -hmm. you sizzle up again. It's, it's an odd thing. But what makes it sizzle up? When you release special material or when another season's coming up um, or, or, you know, around holidays when people have had time. Mm. But I think the one benefit I can say about it is when people are watching in that um, inundating way, they bathe in the characters, they bathe in the story. They, it is so much more real for them in a, in a weird way because they get to go through this whole, they've spent so much time with the characters that I think it's... It, Weirdly, a different relationship in, in consuming it bulk. Uh, I think that's right. I mean, they, you absolutely you live with them. Yeah. I'm curious for you, in, in making Feud and in exploring sort of where Hollywood um, had been and, and, and these relationships, what was the most surprising thing you learned about the sort of Hollywood business? Well, probably that nothing has really changed. I mean, for me, talking to a lot of um, the crew members who were older and specifically talking to Jessica and Susan who've been around since the 80s. That was the most painful thing, that how women are treated and, and ageism in our culture. There's really not been that much progression. I think there's more of a conversation. That to me was the great part about it. Mm -hmm. But the sad part about it was hearing Susan and Jessica talk about um, the last years of Davis and Crawford's life and, and their current creative life, how difficult that has been for them and how much they have to give and they want to contribute. Mm -hmm. And they both have said, you know, you hit 40, 42, and suddenly the phone stops ringing and that's right when you're figuring it out. Mm -hmm. So that that's, was not fun. You no. know, it's painful. And But I'm glad that we got to talk about it and write about it. Sure. So you have a Susan and a Jessica on this. You obviously have an Ewan McGregor. You have these big stars. And a piece of doing the anthology format is that you are asking actors to commit just a season and not, and not seven. What's the downside of playing in that format? Well, you just have to be okay with, with risk and the unknown. You have to be okay with the fact that when you're done, you're done. Now you have to come up with something else. But I'm used to that after, you know, I mean, it's started writing books and then you know, I had two shows canceled after one season, and I've never made a second season of anything. 
So I, I've never said continued next mm-hmm. year. And, and I, I like it. I, I, I find it very exciting. And it's always interesting because I always hit this midpoint in a year of Fargo. And, I, and it feels like th- there's never been another year. Like this is the only year that's ever been. And I felt that in the second year, it's like Jeffrey Donovan and Gene Smart and Kirsten Dunst. And now it's, you know, Ewan and, and Mary Winstead. And, and, and it's a great place to feel like you're, you've lost yourself. You have no context of other versions of this story. And, and uh, I don't know, doing a second season of Legion will be the first time that I have to continue the story. Uh-huh. And, and so, I mean, I'm excited, but I, I'm also a little trepidatious of, sure. of what that is going to be like. Yeah. Are there downsides for you? I say what's the only downside is no network money. That's the only downside. <laughs> when you were doing something that was 22, 24 episodes and it was so creatively difficult and physically taxing and the actors were falling and forget cold and flu season. I mean, that was always a disaster. But then you're like, okay, well, let's just do eight. It feels like your soul is much more nourished and you are able to function mm-hmm. as a human being and a family person, I feel better. And I think that I think it, it, the, the difficult thing about the anthological model is a financial one, meaning how do you pay for it? How do you keep the, um, the business paradigm of it moving? And that's why that uh, format fell out of favor mm-hmm. in at least American television. So it's been trying to figure out, you know, there is a way that you can say to a corporation, let's do this, but you can sell it as a series, but it's kind of its own thing every season so that there is a sale I and mean, that, you know, because it is a business too. It's not Absolutely. just a um, creative endeavor. And that's been a little tricky, but it's also really rewarding. And I always find it's so refreshing. And we live in a Pavlovian time of social media and refreshing and all of our brains and are moving so much quicker. And it just feels natural mm-hmm. to where we are for me. I don't know. Sure, sure. So Ava, you're somebody who started in the independent film world where you were incredibly hands-on in all parts of the process. Um, Moving into television where you also have other projects going on, you know, that little $100 million movie that you're also making, you have to relinquish some amount of control in in making a a television show. How challenging was that for you and, and how do you sort of strike the balance so that you don't have to give up ownership? It was a challenge. I mean, the first season I couldn't do it. I couldn't let go. I had to touch every script. I had to be, you know, I hand selected every director, all women directors. I hand selected each one. I had to be there at some point when they were shooting, if not the whole time. It was, I uh, ran myself a little crazy because I did not know how to um, have my name on something mm-hmm. and it not be, be truly me. I, I still haven't been able to... Everyone at the table correct. knows what uh, yeah. that feels like. It's a, it's a challenge. And as I go into, you know, the opportunity to create other shows and have multiple shows on the air, just something I'm grappling with and having to learn to, you know, build that team that you talk about with, you know, folks that are like-minded and are trying to push a certain, you know, creative agenda forward and work in the way that I like to work with inclusive crews and, you know, um, uh, feeling as if... Uh, we're all going after one thing, not just in the creative aspect, but in the business aspect and the way that we execute, which is a big deal. I used to be a crew member. Mm-hmm. I've been on a many, many crews, about 100 crews before I became a filmmaker. And I know how that feels to be crew and to be disrespected and to be ignored sure. and unseen. So that's a big part of how we make my films, the TV show. And I'm just not sure that's going to happen if I'm not around, you know. So it's been a learn. It's been a learning lesson, you know. Even talking to you know some of these folks in in the breaks, I'm trying to ear hustle. Uh huh. Has anyone had really good hear, advice? Yeah, on how to, I hear how that, to that advice on how to. I don't know if relinquish is the word because that feels like you know a real giving away, but mm-hmm. to kind of open up the space and know that uh, you know with 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 a real strong direction that that folks can kind of take up the mm-hmm. mission and. And continue it forward. So it's, it's all it's all growth process. So a lot of you have also adapted material. Sometimes some of you for the first time. Some of you do that with uh, some regularity. Curious how you make the choice of of what to stick with and what to let go of, and and how nervous are you, particularly when you have a book or a movie that people love and people are expecting things of you. We had to let go pretty quickly because legal came and said we can't use any of the characters in the book except <laughs> Piper. It's like, all right. That makes it easy. Or hard, whichever. Uh, yeah. yeah. So then you just sort of, it's a launching pad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we could go off from there. Mm-hmm. And, and, and actually with Piper's blessing, which was nice. I mean, in, in your case, you were very much honored the book. There was one mm-hmm. thing that, 
that I noticed that you didn't have in there, and that was a backstory mm -hmm. um, of, of abuse. How do you make that decision? Um, on that particular decision, it, it, in script form, we did include a little of that backstory, but it became problematic because in the book, that backstory came after the reveal of the crime. So ah. it felt a little expositional. You know, we were at the peak of the, of the hour in the series mm -hmm. and, and, and didn't want to wane down with explanation. Mm -hmm. We felt, and filmically, we also wanted to go out without dialogue. But I think the last maybe 10 minutes of the series, no one was saying anything. We were doing it all with camera. And there's only so much you could do with camera. We couldn't fill in the backstory of the character you're talking about. But we ultimately, we all felt we didn't really need it. The pieces were there. The actress playing the character knew her backstory. And as long as we were truthful to it, um, we could honor the book without being maybe per se faithful mm -hmm. to, the, to the page. Is that something but, you would explore if you had a, another season? Yeah, to play with? well, I was blessed on this too because I had a, a, an extremely talented director uh -huh. who was able to tell story with camera in a way that made it very economical in terms of depicting most everything that was in that book. We were faithful. I loved the book. Mm -hmm. If anything, it was kind of daunting because, okay, I, I can only screw this up. But um, somehow it, it all came together and worked despite my efforts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about the rest of you? I mean, does that give you pause? I mean, do you, do you worry about, I mean, <clears throat> tackling something like Legion, you have these very, very rabid fans who, yeah. who want a certain thing. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's the same with the Coens uh, uh -huh. in terms of the preciousness of the material to people. And I think what saved me with Fargo was that I, I wasn't adapting the movie. There's nothing that happens in the show that happened in the movie. I wasn't trying to do Marge. I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to do any of those pieces. So I was just saying, oh, you like that story? Here's another story you might like. And then with Legion, I sort of took the same approach, which was I'm going to take the concept of this character and then create my own story. Because I think it's important to try to create something unpredictable mm -hmm. and try to engage the audience's imagination and not make watching a passive experience. But and especially if you're trying to do something where you're playing with the structure of it and you're creating something surreal, I think it's more exciting if people don't know where it's going or, or what it all means. But I do feel the biggest difference of, in the evolution of the, this medium is that the best writers and showrunners have become filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, so it's less about the writer brain and it's more about the filmmaker brain. And, and um, you start to think visually, you start to think, I mean, I get very excited if if I can have 10 minutes without dialogue, as much as I love writing dialogue, that gets very exciting for mm -hmm. me. But then it becomes a weird thing when you have to delegate that because the writer brain can be a collaborative brain, but the filmmaker brain tends to be a singular mm -hmm. brain. So how do you train other directors to direct like you would mm -hmm. and then not find yourself in the editing room going, I just don't understand. <laughs> Why is the camera moving right mm -hmm. now? There's no reason for the camera mm -hmm. to be moving uh -huh. right now. Ryan, in your case, a lot of what you are tackling are, are things that happen. People mm -hmm. have memories of, whether it's an OJ, I mean, you're going to do mm -hmm. um, Diana and Charles mm -hmm. next. How do you, with something like that, how do you approach, how do you decide what goes in and, and what gets, uh, what is left on the cutting room floor and, and how sort of, what is that process like for you? Whenever I'm beginning something like that, I do a really weird thing, which is, it's like kind of my own polling, uh -huh. where I would talk to people for, for many weeks, if not months, saying, of all the O.J. Simpson moments of that trial and that story, like, what are the 10 most memorable things to you? And what would you be really disappointed mm -hmm. if you were watching and that wasn't in there? What are the things from, from Charles and Diana that people couldn't imagine not having? That is a trickier one, because I think that a lot of that is by the nature of the royal family behind closed doors. Absolutely. But I think the very famous interview, you know, that she did, where she talked about that there were three people in the marriage, mm -hmm. the raising of those children. And sometimes it's not even a specific thing. Um, it's a, a feeling that people want or they feel. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then you make it your own. I mean, there was at some point, I think, in the OJ miniseries where we didn't have the trying on of the glove. That mm -hmm. scene was perfectly, was purposely removed from a script to see how we would all feel about it. Mm -hmm. But then at a certain point, I think we just throw everything away and you kind of have to make it your own because if your heart isn't in it and your passion isn't in it as a storyteller, then it's not gonna work. But I am always, always interested in that about history. It's like, well, why are you interested mm -hmm. in but it's more about the, the in the formation time, the creation time, the genesis time. Like, why? What would you want to see in a Princess Diana miniseries? I'd be interested. 
Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think part of what makes that so fascinating is so much is behind closed doors. There's so much we yeah. don't know. And that's what made The Crown such a, a thrilling show because we felt like we got a peek behind the curtain. Right. So if you do that, I mean, that's, that's where what makes it interesting. Yeah. All right, a lightning round question for everyone. Who's your favorite character on TV that you have nothing to do with? Current, past? Archie Bunker. Molly Dodd. Buffy. Gotta be Omar. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Cersei Lannister. Uh, the OA. What's the show you cannot miss? Jeopardy. Atlanta right now. John Oliver. 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm like a news junkie, so I could go on and on. It's not Don Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to be when you grew up? If we asked a five-year-old version of you, what would you say you, uh, or the 10-year-old version of you, what would, would you have told us you want to be? I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a pediatrician. Huh. I was going to be a singer named Rainbow Star. <laughs> well, wow. Singer slash actress. <laughs> I really didn't know. I, part of me wanted to be a lawyer, part of me wanted to play hockey, but I really didn't grow up saying, this is it for me. Hmm. Lawyer. At 10? At 10. Probably a baseball player. Yeah. Um, which TV family uh, or character do you most identify with? The family of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. That sort of formation of a workplace family where you can maybe get the thing that you could not get from your real family was always very intriguing mm. to me. Okay. That's to you. If it's just a character, that works too. I didn't grow up seeing a family that felt like anything that I was connected to. Even Cosby's, they were just, had a lot more than we had, you know, so I just couldn't quite get into it, but I've seen more of that now, so hopefully everyone has a good answer to that question. Yeah. Drawing a blank. Yeah. I don't know if it was a family, but Andy Griffith. The Andy uh -huh. Griffith show growing up. And I think it was that sense of community and the, the, the idea that, that people um, nurtured each other and cheered for each other was um, just a, a wonderful ideology to subscribe to. Something that you felt, that you wanted to yeah. feel? Yeah. The very first show I did was called Picket Fences. <laughs> And yes. um, I, the Andy Griffith show was in the back of my brain when huh. carving that out. Huh. I love that. Have one? Gosh, I, I don't know. We failed. I, mean, I remember that whole Thursday night lineup being impactful. Um, the Seinfelds, the Friends. Yeah, no, before no. that. It was Cheers, oh, oh, oh. and it was Cosby, and it was Hill Street Blues. And I'm, I'm giving away my age, but... Um, <laughs> And I remember being much younger and fighting for the Brady Bunch because yeah. I wanted to stay up till 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've done it. Thank you guys for being a part of this and a wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Oprah. Hey, I'm Issa Rae. Catherine Hahn. Kevin Bacon. Philly Bob Thornton. Elizabeth Moss. Chris Jenner. Minnie Driver. And thanks for watching. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. The Hollywood Reporter. On YouTube. On YouTube. Hold on. One more time. Be sure to hit subscribe for more videos.